Welcome to Conversations with the Fed. My name is Carmi Anna Matson. I am the Assistant Vice President of Regional Outreach and Public Programs at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Today we have with us our Senior Vice President and General Counsel, Neil Willardson, who will be speaking on Hamilton Central Bank then and now. A few Announcements before we begin the presentation. Neil will be allowing for some Q&A at the end of his presentation. We will entertain those questions via the chat feature on Zoom. So if you locate the chat button located at the bottom of your screen, you can type questions in the chat box at any point during the presentation and I will pose those to Neil at the end of his presentation. We will also be following up with all registrants for this event. We will send you an email early next week that contains a link to Neil's video, as well as some additional resources you may be interested in. And at the end of the presentation, you'll be presented with a survey to give us a little feedback about this event. Those are all the announcements I have. So welcome again to Conversations with the Fed, and I'll turn it over to Neil Willardson. Great, thanks so much, Carmi. Uh, well, it's really great to be with all of you today to talk a little bit about Alexander Hamilton, one of America's founding fathers. He certainly influenced today's central bank, uh, and we want to today talk about where there's some similarities between Hamilton's Bank of the United States and today's Federal Reserve System. At the same time, it's also helpful to look back at the founding of the United States and see how the debates and differences shape not only the first bank of the United States, but other aspects of our financial system. So today I hope to illustrate how Alexander Hamilton was a visionary for much of the Federal Reserve, our central bank. He was the United States' first central banker. I'm sure many of you have seen the Hamilton play live, seen the movie on Disney Plus, or maybe listened to the soundtrack. I had the opportunity to see the play in Minneapolis with my family a little over two years ago. It's really a phenomenal work, uh, telling the story of one of our founding fathers and draws heavily from R&B, hip hop, and other musical genres. And Lin-Manuel Miranda brilliantly casted people of color as the founding fathers and other historical figures to produce one of the most successful Broadway shows in history. Miranda described his work about America then as told by America now. Hamilton, the play, focused on the wide range of his contributions to our republic as Miranda drew from the 2004 biography by Ron Chernow for his content. I also draw from Chernow's great uh, work for this talk and dig into some historical academic work on the origins of the First Bank of the United States. I also looked at some of the newspapers, the 1800s, and many other sources, including some work just published by Jesse Sir Filippi, a historian at Albion's, Albany's Schuyler Mansion. So here's where I'm going to go today. The core part of what I hope to cover focuses on Hamilton's influence on the Federal Reserve today. But I want to bookend that discussion with some background information about Hamilton, because his upbringing influenced his positions on central banking. And then at the end, we, of course, have to talk about Hamilton's tragic passing in a duel that took his life on July 11th, 1804 in Weehawken, New Jersey. So let's go ahead and dive in. Hamilton was born in either 1755 or 1757 on the tiny island of Nevis in the British West Indies. Lynn Manuel Miranda would say Hamilton was dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean. Most references to Hamilton say he was born in 1757 because that's what he told people. And that's what's on his tombstone in New York near Trinity Church, not far from the New York Fed. But the public records in Nevis in the West Indies suggest 1755. It appears as though Hamilton may have changed his birthday a bit to make his candidacy more attractive to people that he hoped would hire him as, a, as an apprentice. It also made him look even more like a prodigy when he came to the United States later. Hamilton certainly had a challenging childhood. He was the founding father without a father, and at only 14, he was in charge of a trading charter. In 1772, Hamilton wrote an account of a hurricane that hit St. Croix, and it so impressed the locals that they all chipped in to send him to New York for his education. Now, there's lots of wonderful details about Hamilton that we could spend hours on and really still not uh, scratch the depths 
of his interests and contributions. So to help provide a bit of a contemporary handle on Hamilton, we decided to create our own private LinkedIn page about him. So let's, so this is what it looks like. And let's assume this is around 1796 and Alexander Hamilton is no longer treasury secretary having served as a first treasury secretary as under uh, President Washington. And he says, you know, I need, to, I need to network a little bit. So on his LinkedIn page, you can see some of his affiliations. You can see that he went to King's College for a bit, which later became Columbia College and then Columbia University. And of course, Hamilton served in the U.S. Army during the Revolutionary War. It was during those Revolutionary War days that he began to link up with some of his key influencers shown on the right. So it's a pretty impressive list of LinkedIn buddies. Uh, there are people like George Washington, who led the Revolutionary War efforts with Hamilton at his side as aide de camp. Of course, Washington set the standard as a two-term first president from 1789 to 1797. Some of other Hamilton's other influencers include the Schuyler sisters, Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy. And while the musical depicts Hamilton meeting his friends Lafayette, America's favorite founding Frenchman, Lawrence and Mulligan, all at the same time in a tavern, he actually met them over a period of years. But he was friends with each of them. Uh, on his link to his pin page, you see Hamilton's co-authors of the Federalist Papers, James Madison, James Madison and John Jay. Although Hamilton wrote the vast majority of these 85 papers and is credited with something like 51 of them. So this picture depicts the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787. In the foreground, you can see Alexander Hamilton whispering to Benjamin Franklin. Now this Howard Christie painting depicts 39 of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. It doesn't include the three who didn't sign the Constitution or the 13 that left during the convention. Hamilton wrote the call for the Constitution Convention in the first place and was also a signer. Now, after looking at that picture of the Constitutional Convention of only white men and largely wealthy white men, it's a good time to pause to comment and talk about Alexander Hamilton on race and in particular slavery. The continued racial inequities and in policing education, employment, and other areas of society which have been highlighted over the last several months and years require this re-examination. The diverse America that Miranda so thoughtfully portrays in his play was not present at the time of our admittedly flawed founding fathers. Now, despite hopeful statements by Hamilton and others that all men, and notably Hamilton did not say people, have one common origin, nature and right, quoted above, that simply was not the case at the time. Miranda himself noted that the founding fathers and others were complicit in slavery, and people like Annette Gordon-Reed and Akeet Paul that are quoted above noted that rather than challenge slavery, these founding fathers accepted it, including the three-fifth rule in the Constitution to appease Southern states that treated African Americans more like property than citizens. And this compromise is painfully described in Federalist Paper 53. Some of this re-examination continues even over the last month or so. Uh, recently, Jesse Sir Filippi, a historian at the Schuyler Mansion, and yes, that's that Schuyler Mansion, uh, published a thoughtful paper reviewing primary sources which reveal, and I quote from this Sir Filippi, that the enslavement of men, women, and children of African descent was part of both Hamilton's professional and personal life. Sir Filippi uses Hamilton's own records, and Hamilton was a very detailed record keeper, to make her case that Hamilton not only supported other slaveholders, but he actually owned slaves himself. In this way, she appropriately notes that the myth of Hamilton as the abolitionist founding father should end. After that brief but important discussion about Hamilton and slavery, let's turn back to the 1780s. The collection of essays called the Federalist Papers, I actually have my very own copy here. Thanks for a nice nighttime reading. At the time was, 
was urging is, uh, citizens to support the ratification of the Constitution, and those essays were published anonymously in the New York newspapers. The basic theme of the Federalist Papers was that the Constitution would preserve the Union and empower the federal government to act firmly and coherently in the national interest. Hamilton wasn't born or raised in the United States, so unlike other fathers, founding fathers, he didn't have a strong state or regional influence connection, unlike people like Jefferson and Madison and others that we'll talk about in just a bit. The Federalist Papers were not only very influential at the time, they were truly influential, but they've also been cited more than 300, time, 300 times in U.S. Supreme Court cases. Now let's go back to Hamilton's LinkedIn page. I want to turn to Hamilton's appointment by George Washington as the first Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. Treasury Department was created by an act of Congress and its influence under Hamilton was truly remarkable. Within a year of Hamilton's formation of the Treasury Department and beginning of the department, there were something like 53 Treasury staffers. And this compares to only five at state under Thomas Jefferson and three at the War Department under Knox. You could say Hamilton doesn't hesitate. He exhibits no restraint in taking quick action to make Treasury a force. I should pause here for a moment as we recently recognized an historic first when former chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, was recently announced as a likely appointee as a Treasury Secretary for President-elect Biden. Janet Yellen was not only the first female chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, she was the first woman to leave the San Francisco, lead the San Francisco Fed but she'll now also be the first woman to serve as a Secretary of Treasury. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work with Janet Yellen while I, when I did a stint to the Board of Governors a few years back. She's a truly an amazing leader and I have no doubt that she will be an incredible Treasury Secretary. So let's turn back briefly to Hamilton's leadership in driving change in our financial system, even as early as 1790s. Richard Silla and David Cohen's book on financial history defy, describe this period in the 1790s and late 1780s as Hamilton's financial revolution, noting the key aspects of a successful economic system. These included things like effective institutions of public finance, founding a central bank to aid the government's finances and serve as a central node to banking and financial system, creating the US dollar as the country's unit of account and medium of exchange and fostering growth by encouraging states to create banks, to lend to businesses, and also fostering the growth of the security markets to make assets more liquid and transferable and generally foster the growth of business corporations. It didn't stop there. Hamilton gave a lot of thought to a specific financial plan would, which would include some key components. And these components were critically important for the economy, but they were also important for the concept of a federal government more broadly. A key discussion at the time was the assumption of the war debts of the colonies that ultimately would provide some of the funding for the running of government. Now the assumption of debt at the time was a really big deal. Uh, Noah Webster, who was a schoolmaster of America, said at the time the establishment of funds to maintain public credit could have an amazing effect on the face of business in the country. He said money can circulate freely, commerce rev revives, and the country can be full of provisions. Manufacturers are increasing. The increase of capital must have great effects and stand unparalleled in the history of commerce. You can see this idea that the economy was beginning to grow and build even at this period of time in the late 18th century. Hamilton viewed the assumption of debt as a key part of a full economic puzzle. And even though there were only a few banks around at the time, Hamilton envisioned a national bank with considerably greater influence in the government, but along with some private characteristics. So a key component of Hamilton's financial plan was the concept of a central bank. You see in the central bank those embedded components of the financial plan. 
These include the concept of a U.S. currency, something that really wasn't envisioned until Hamilton's Bank of the United States. Of course, of course, that concept is something that continues to this day with Hamilton on the $10 bill. Well, sometimes we need to be reminded that democracy can be messy, and the 1790s was really no exception. Hamilton had what he thought was a good idea, but there were more than just a few that didn't like it. And there were two key players that had their own idea, Jefferson and Madison, and they were diametrically opposed foes to Hamilton. They didn't like it, a number of the aspects of the financial plan, assumption of debts and the ability to tax among them. This disagreement went back to a differing economic view. Jefferson and Madison were Virginians that had a more agrarian vision for the United States and were concerned about too much federal power vis-a-vis -vis the states. Now back to Aham and G. Wash. These two certainly felt the plan and the Bank of the United States was a constitutional exercise of implied powers. And here's a nice alliterative phrase from me that didn't appear in the musical. It's constitutional, commercial, workable, and economical. And it must, it must be nice for Hamilton to have Washington on his side. So this is an early test for the national plan, for Hamilton's national plan, and the federal government more broadly. Now, as it happens in 1790, this is around June of 1790, Hamilton runs into Jefferson in New York City. And the financial plan where the government would assume state debts and the states would pay taxes had just been rejected. Jefferson and Madison were both opposed to state assumption, in part because Virginia had nearly repaid its debts. Debts were owed to many through the script issued at the time. But Hamilton said, unless you could establish credit, you could never have an effective economy. So Jefferson set up a dinner at his house, arranging the menu, the venue, and the seating. And all three, Madison, Jefferson, and Hamilton, are invited. One of the most famous meals in American history, right there on Maiden Lane, across the street from where the New York Fed stands today. Well, quite possibly one of my favorite tunes in Hamilton the Musical is The Room Where It Happens, where Miranda talks about this controversy in a very clever way. He brings Madison, Jefferson, and Hamilton together in a room, which did happen, and notes that they are diametrically opposed foes. But the primary lead in the song was Aaron Burr, who wasn't in the room where it happened, well, as it turns out, I wasn't in the room either. But I'm going to give my perspective, just like Burr in, in Miranda's Hamilton. Now, reports from that diplomatic meeting describe a chess match, match. Think of maybe the Queen's Gambit in Netflix. Well, not exactly quite like that. It was more of a discussion. And Hamilton felt strongly that the financial plan, and in particular, the assumption of debts was the key glue that would keep the country together. But reports of the time suggest that it was a quid pro quo. At the same time, there was a debate about the financial plan. There was an important discussion about the placement of the nation's capital. Many thought the de facto financial center of the country, New York and New York City, would be ideal. Others felt that the capital should be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, given its large population and key role in the formation of our nation. And while Jefferson and Madison opposed the financial plan, they were united in the desire to have the new nation's capital on the Potomac River in a location now known as Washington, D.C. And even after the bill passed 39 to 20 and was sent to him, President Washington took the full 10 days afforded him and sought counsel from cabinet members of the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. Attorney General Randolph and Department of State Jefferson felt that the Bank of the United States was unconstitutional because it wasn't something specifically delineated in the Constitution. Washington submitted the Randolph and Jefferson briefs to Hamilton, who promptly pulled an all-nighter working with his wife, Eliza, 
to produce his report, noting that every power in a government includes the means requisite and applicable to the attainment of the ends, and such that if the power to form a national bank was implicit in the Constitution. Washington signed the bill and agreed with Hamilton, and the residence bill was also signed the next day. So this is a bit of a timeline. George Washington signs the bill containing the provisions for the National Bank and opens its doors thereafter. And the slide here provides the big picture overview of the history of the first bank in the United States, including, including its inception, the early challenges, including a financial panic and its closure some 20 years later. While the bank didn't survive long, many of the basic principles and foundations of that bank influenced other central banks including today's Federal Reserve. Now let's lead with the scope of responsibilities for both the Bank of the United States and today's Federal Reserve System. Both have public and private characteristics, but the Bank of the United States had a closer connection to the private side. Given that it served as a commercial bank, it sold stock to the public, it made loans to the public, and it took deposits. At the same time, it had some decidedly governmental functions like collecting taxes that are now, of course, part of today's modern day Treasury Department, not the Federal Reserve. And today's Fed is responsible for the country's monetary policy through the Federal Open Market Committee. It also plays key roles today in bank regulation supervision and in payments in financial stability. Now, shared between both the Bank of the United States and the Fed are those fiscal agent roles, although they're of different character today than they were back in those Bank of the United States days. The Bank of the United States collected tax revenues, it secured government funds, and it paid government bills. The Fed today acts as the government's, government's bank and performs several services for the U.S. Treasury. It maintains U.S. Treasury accounts, it processes government checks, it issues and redeems savings bonds, it collects federal tax deposits, among other services, that it's doing on behalf of the, of the U.S. Treasury. And the Minneapolis Fed plays a key role in this regard, providing Treasury retail support services to customers. Now, this slide tees up a series of perspectives on the similarities and differences uh, in governance between the Bank of the United States and the Federal Reserve System. Now, both have main offices and regional offices reflecting the key importance of regional influence in policy and administration. Both have public purposes and independent directors that form a core of our governance. Now, this picture of the Bank of the United States, the geography of the Bank of the United States, shows a limited geography of the U.S. at the time as well. You can see that the branches at the top from the Boston and the, from Boston to Savannah on the eastern seaboard, along with New Orleans as the furthest west branch of the United, Bank of the United States. This current picture of the Federal Reserve shows its main offices. There are 12 reserve banks and 24 branches governed by the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. As this picture reflects the system as formed in 1914, you steer, still see something of a weighting towards the eastern part of the United States. A key message, however, is the importance of local input to the monetary policy process, and that's reflected in the unique governance of the Federal Reserve System. Congress wanted to make sure that regions across the country were directly rep represented in policy making, making, and that continues to this day. This decentralized system is consistent with the governance for not philosophies that underpin our country's formation more broadly. I'm going to provide some additional details on the unique governance of the Fed, starting with the role that the Board of Governors plays. The board is an independent agency and led by seven governors who are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Of course, the current chair of the Board of Governors is Jay Powell. Next, I'm going to turn to the role of bank directors and leadership of both the Bank of the United States and the Federal Reserve System. I look back at some of those texts that I talked about earlier, um, some of the history and the financial history of the United States, and looked at the first 25 directors of the Bank of the United States, 
Nine of those directors were from Pennsylvania. Seven were from New York. Four were from Massachusetts. One each from Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Connecticut. And those first board members of the Bank of the United States included three senators and four congressmen. Included four lawyers, merchants, brokers, and a physician. Most of the uh, directors of the Bank of the United States were Federalists, and all directors were men. Thomas Willing was the first president of the Bank of the United States. And now today's Federal Reserve. Each reserve bank is a corporation of the United States formed in 1914. Now, there's a picture there of Neil Kashkari. That's the larger picture in the upper left. And Neil served as the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Fed. He also is the bank's representative to the Federal Open Market Committee and today and this year serves as a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee. Just below Neil is Ron Feldman, who is the first vice president and chief operating officer of the Minneapolis Fed. The remainder of the bank's management committee is on the picture, is pictured to the right. And as noted above, the president and the first vice president of each reserve bank are appointed and reappointed by six of the nine reserve bank directors subject to approval by the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. And like the Bank of the United States, we also have directors to oversee reserve bank operations. But unlike those directors, our current directors provide key business insights to support the monetary policy process. That's that unique aspect of today's Federal Reserve System. This picture shows the nine directors of the main office, the Minneapolis Fed, and the additional directors of our branch in Helena, Montana. Unlike those Bank of the United States directors, Federal Reserve directors cannot hold political office, and there's a focus on diversity from a variety of dimensions. That includes diversity from an industry and sector perspective, geographic diversity, gender diversity, diversity and racial ethnicity diversity. As I dug further and looking at some of those similarities and differences between the Bank of the United States and today's Federal Reserve System, I read some great historical perspectives on the Bank of the United States, including David Cohen's excellent book on the origins and impact of the Bank of the United States. I was really uh, initially surprised by some of those similarities that were not really prominently discussed in the areas of transparency and stability. So one of the key features of any banks, especially central banks, is on the quality and the accuracy of their financials. And the quality and accuracy of and even transparency was an early focus of the Bank of the United States with Hamilton requiring the production of weekly financial statements. So this statement goes back to the 1790s. Now, while Hamilton's bank, bank made some important attempts to be transparent, Today's Fed has a significant and even greater commitment that goes well beyond the Bank of the United States, as, uh, as you might expect. The Federal Reserve is accountable to Congress, we're a creature of Congress and the public, and we provide substantial information consistent with the Fed's trans uh, commitment to transparency. This includes audit and financial information, including independent audits and information on the various policy actions of the Federal Reserve. Some of those areas of transparency are noted above on the slide. Now, financial stability was tested a few times in the early days of the Bank of the United States, first in 1791 and then in 1792. Then Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, responded to those concerns by making open market purchases of government securities. Hamilton acted like central banks of today in providing liquidity in making those, in those cases, by making direct open market purchases of those government securities. Treasury acted in some ways as a lender of last resort, providing funding to banks uh, in ailing banks, either directly or indirectly through the Bank of the United States. And branch officers of the Bank of the United States had something of a discount window function, not much different than what we see today in the reserve banks, providing funding to banks, especially in the case of extreme liquidity needs. And Treasury and the Bank of the United States had an interest in the banking system more broadly. 
but this is nothing like the current and supervision and regulatory system that we see in today's Federal Reserve or in the other regulatory agencies in the United States. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve system took unprecedented action in 2008 to respond to the financial crisis, and more recently in response to the pandemic. In collaboration with the Treasury, the Fed has taken a broad array of actions to respond to the economic damage from the pandemic, including trillions in lending to households, employers, financial markets, and state and local governments. As Chair Powell has indicated, these actions will be used forcefully, proactively, and aggressively until we are confident that we are on solidly on the road to recovery. Well, I managed to get us right close up to the end uh, to Hamilton's life without spending too much time talking about Aaron Burr. And those of you that remember Lynn Manuel's play, um, there's lots of talk about uh, Aaron Burr throughout the play, but I've left it to the end here uh, during today's talk. Now, perhaps I did this because no one's written a Broadway smash musical about Aaron Burr, but Burr and Hamilton will be linked forever due to their famous duel held in 1804. As Miranda's work illustrated, they had a number of interactions throughout the years. Burr was born in 1756, so depending on who you believe here uh, and about who you believe in terms of Hamilton's birth, he was either a year older or a year younger than Alexander Hamilton. Burr served as a, con a Continental Army officer in the American Revolutionary War after which he became a successful lawyer and politician. And actually, Hamilton and Burr uh, served and represented some clients uh, together in, in their days, uh, both serving as lawyers in New York. Burr served in the New York State Assembly, was the New York Attorney General, and served as a U.S. Senator and was, of course, Vice President when he was defeated by Jefferson in the Electoral College after Hamilton supported Jefferson in the election of 1800. Burr was also defeated as New York governor after Hamilton supported his opponent. See a pattern here? While Hamilton was fairly close to Burr in terms of some of his policy perspective, he did not support Burr because he thought that Burr was in it for himself. And he said that Burr had no morals. Hamilton felt that Burr ought not to be trusted with the reins of government and made that clear to Burr and others. Now the duel itself may not be the most interesting part of the history between these early Americans, although it is pretty darn interesting. In somewhat typical fashion for those days and the sort of the code of the duels, both Burr and Hamilton and their seconds exchanged a series of letters prior to the duel in this time-honored attempt to cool things down after Hamilton apparently slighted Burr. Now, while I was doing some of the research for this talk, I was really struck by the efforts that Hamilton and those around him took to tell his story. Hamilton's papers during his political life and even the detailed letters between Hamilton and Burr were carefully retained due to instructions given to Hamilton's second, Nathaniel Pendleton. And those papers, along with accounts published shortly after the duel by both Burr's and Hamilton's second, seem to be the most reliable accounts of the duel. Amazingly, within a week or two, details of those accounts were published in the newspapers of today, and those are available on the internet, along with the letters and portions of Hamilton's journaling, and also his last will and testament. Well, you probably know the rest of the story. Burr and Hamilton, along with their seconds and a physician, rode across the Hudson to Weehawken, New Jersey. Hamilton wrote a letter to his wife, Eliza, to be delivered one day after his death. Remarkably, Hamilton's letters and last will and testament were again published in New York newspapers at the time, one of which was founded by Hamilton earlier. And that helped establish Hamilton's position in the duel itself. For the duel, Hamilton and Burr marked out their 10 paces, the duel taking place right near the spot where Hamilton's son, Philip, had died in a duel defending his honor, Hamilton's honor, just three years earlier. Hamilton told his second that he intended to satisfy both his religious principles and honor by not firing. 
was similar advice that Hamilton gave to his son, Philip. The first-hand accounts of the duel agreed that two shots were fired, although the seconds disagreed on the time between the shots. Some accounts ind indicated that Hamilton apparently fired a shot well above Burr's head, and Pendleton insisted later that he recovered the bullet in a tree much higher than where Burr stood. So Hamilton was determined to throw away his shot, so to speak. Burr fired and hit Hamilton the lower abdomen above the right hip. It was a mortal wound, and Hamilton died some 30 hours later. Hamilton died on July 12, 1804, at age 49. There was an outpouring of remorse. Because of Hamilton's visionary thinking, America had the highest credit rating in the world. And Eliza, Hamilton's wife, would staunchly guard Hamilton's memory long after his death. Now, the first bank of the United States was not renewed after a 20 year term limit. And then there was a second bank of the United States, which also had only a second 20 year run. There are a series of challenging crises during the 1800s. And ultimately today's Federal Reserve was formed through legislation signed by Woodrow Wilson on December 13th, 1913. Reserve banks were chartered, chartered in 1914. As Neil Kashkari has noted, the Federal Reserve is the modern manifestation of Hamilton's original vision for American National Bank, updated to meet the needs of our large, diverse economy. Hamilton's legacy of pu public service is instilled in the Federal Reserve today. We're here to serve the public by pursuing a growing economy and a stable financial system that work for all of us. Hamilton found his identity in making a contribution to public service. These attributes remain a key part of those of us who work for the Federal Reserve. And with that, I'll close it off, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Neil. If you have questions for Neil, you can type those in the chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom window. We have had a number of questions already come in through the chat, so we'll see how many we can get through in the next 20 minutes or so. So, Neil, first question, and this is at, isn't actually related to Hamilton, but is an important thing to clear up. An astute viewer of your early slide that had the map of the Federal Reserve System on it noted that it appeared that the Minneapolis Fed services the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, though not the rest of the state. And they were kind of wondering about that. And is that the case in other Federal Reserve districts? And, and maybe to elaborate from there, you know, what's the history of establishing those districts? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a good catch by the viewer. Yes, uh, the Ninth Federal Reserve District includes just the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The lower part of Michigan is part of the Chicago Fed or the Seventh District. So that is um, a part of the uh, process in thinking about the Federal Reserve System. There was, a, there was a discussion about where the Federal Reserve cities could be or should be. And there was a, form, a formation committee that was formed under the Congressional Acts. And the, the Congress did not say there should be exactly 12 banks. There was a range of banks that's considered in the legislation. And this formation committee did a bit of a roadshow. And cities bid on whether there should be... Uh, uh, whether where the city uh, for the Reserve Bank should be. For example, in usual fashion, Minneapolis and St. Paul had a debate and discussion about whether it should be in Minneapolis or St. Paul. And in this case, Minneapolis happened to win out. Um, so yes, and some of those geographic boundaries were established after uh, con the congressional action and some do split up states just like the ninth district does. Thanks, Neil. Let's turn now to some more Hamilton specific questions. What disagreements, if any, do you think Hamilton would have had with today's Fed policies? Yeah, no, that's 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 a good question. And, you know, in terms of, of Fed governance, um, even though the first bank had uh, separate branches, as we've noted, uh, along that eastern seaboard. Hamilton was originally not a big fan of branches of the Bank of the United States. Uh, he had to be convinced, and this was a usual process where there was a debate and discussion, that it made sense to have more of a distributed system to meet the needs of the region and the communities that they served. Um, his strong interest, Hamilton's strong interest in a central authority may have suggested that the Board of Governors in today's world would have a greater weighting on the Federal Open Market Committee 
it is interesting we have a policy arm of for monetary policy that includes that regional input, that process of rotating presidents of the reserve banks to serve on the Federal Open Market Committee, along with the Board of Governors to provide that policy perspective. And that's really pretty unique to the American uh, Federal Reserve or the American Central Bank. And so that might be something a little bit different than maybe Hamilton would have envisioned. But I think, as you see, is the success of that regional influence and the kind of uh, success of our economic vitality, I think he would say that's worked out well. Um, in terms of policies, um, and let's talk to the sort of the extreme financial and economic environment in 2008 and even with the pandemic, I think he would say in his experiences and actions during his own crisis in the 1790s, would he would he I think that would suggest that Hamilton would be supportive of actions taken by the Federal Reserve and by the Treasury and the government more broadly um, in response to actions taken in 2008 and also some of those concerns that happened during the pandemic. So I think he would support those um, those financial actions that were taken by both the government and the Federal Reserve. And do we know where Hamilton came up with his ideas for a central bank? Was some of that from the Bank of England? Was that Adam Smith? Where where was he drawing from? Yeah, uh, you got it. Both uh, central bank, uh, the central bank of the UK, the Bank of England, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, you know, he was a vociferous reader. Um, and even though he grew up and he was a person of limited means, he drew from lots of reading himself in his early days when, you know, he was a teen, but also, uh, you know, the process of engaging with others and, and reading and, and talking with others about what would be appropriate uh, for the central bank and the bank, uh, the first bank of the United States was part of his thinking and process. And so there were, there were others that influenced him as well. Well, and speaking of folks who influenced him, will you talk a little bit more about Eliza's role and how influential you think she was in terms of historical events? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, she, she's really a sort of an unsung hero here. Um, you know, the Miranda, Lynn manuel Miranda and Cherno give considerable attention to Hamilton's strong sh friendship and affection uh, to Eliza and also, um, you know, the friendship that he had with Angelica. Um, and this was, you know, shown in the correspondence between Eliza and also Angelica in the time. Um, Eliza was really a force in Hamilton's thinking, and she aided Hamilton in many of his writings. Um, his 31-page letter, for example, to Robert Morris provided some of the background for what would later be the financial system um, and that was in her handwriting. Um, she supported Hamilton in the writing of the Federalist Papers. She often served as an intermediary between Hamilton and some of those publishers. Um, many per people observed that Eliza was the treasurer of the household of eight children while Hamilton served as the secretary of the treasury. And I think importantly, um, and again, this is really part of one of the true gifts that we've received from the Hamilton estate, uh, because when ha Alexander Hamilton passed, Eliza played a key role in the preservation of that history. Um, she also worked to repay Hamilton's considerable debts. Um, she worked to have Hamilton's work published by the Library of Congress, and she lived to the ripe old age of 97. So Eliza was not only during Hamilton's life, but afterwards, really a key part of our history and our financial history of the United States. It's a question about whether there was kind of a push and a pull situation between internationalists and nationalists at the time. Can you speak to that a little bit? No, definitely. And that that also, um, you know, what what's interesting when you look at the financial history, the financial history of the United States has a has some interesting parallels to the regular and the political history of the United States. So every time that there were questions about how we connected financially to, to um, other countries, those same debates were taking place during the political history of the United States. And, you know, some of the politicians at the time had a closer allegiance to say the French versus the English. And those same um, influences were part of the debate in the discussion between uh, Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison and some of the folks that were thinking about how do we how do we frame our our history over time, our political views, and how do we frame 
our, our financial institutions. And um, Hamilton, I think, ultimately won out on the financial history. I mean, he really did press the vision. Now, he didn't get everything right. I would say that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't, he didn't bat a thousand. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, he was, uh, he was definitely a Hall of Famer when it came to being right with respect and, and being influential in developing really a, a market economy, one that was focused on economic growth for, for all within the country and not focused on just a few that maybe some others would have probably focused more attention on. And do you think that Hamilton would have supported an independent Fed or would he have thought it should have been part of the Treasury? You know, that, that, that is a good question because you do see that in some of the, you know, uh, the, as we talked about the, the focus of um, the Bank United States and, and the role in taxes, uh, the Treasury more broadly and the role of taxes and the Bank United States on taxes. And I think he might have seen more of a melding of those two. Um, I think it has served us well uh, to have that separation, that independence uh, of, the, of the Federal Reserve from the government. Um, there's certainly a lot of economic papers that are written about independent central bank. And to, you know, there's certainly accountability, uh, no question, accountability to the government and the people of the United States. But having that independence can lead to better policies so that no individual politician or group of politicians would influence what otherwise would be sound economic policy in the direction, in this case, of the Federal Open Market Committee. And again, there are you know, appointees of the Federal Reserve that are appointed by the president that are confirmed by the Senate uh, that serve relatively long terms in part to support that independence over time. Do we know if Hamilton or any of the founding fathers argued for a role of government in providing a social safety net? Uh, yeah, you know, that that's a good question. Um, I, you know, that's one that I'm, I'm just not as familiar with. I, I think if you go back, um, you know, Hamilton was, again, a big believer in having uh, a, 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 broad, a potential for broad economic growth. And over time, you know, that, that, is, that has morphed over time. And we've seen, as we discussed earlier, not everybody, not all people had the opportunity to contribute to the economy in those days. And so yeah, even, when, even when I use those words of having an opportunity of economic growth, um, a lot of people were left out of that vision during the 1790s and the 1800s, and even well into the 1900s and today, unfortunately. And that's part of what today's Federal Reserve is, is trying to focus on and the Federal Reserve Bank in, in Minneapolis in particular. Um, but yes, I think, you know, we, we also will have thought about the separation of monetary policy and fiscal policy. And certainly fiscal policy often is one that's focused on that, that, that safety net. So there is, um, I guess we have to think about what's the appropriate role of a central bank, um, certainly raising the concerns, highlighting those issues and identifying where there's opportunities, knowing that fiscal policy is ultimately going to be the one that's going to be directly responsive and supporting that social safety net more broadly. Well, and related to people who were overlooked in Hamilton's economy, there was a question about to what extent do you think that Hamilton was influenced by the role of slavery in the economy? Yeah, no, and, and you know, there, there is, again, I think one thing that's been very interesting, and I noted some of the recent work that's been done uh, uh, in, on this front, you know, Hamilton himself, when he was in Nevis, I mean, he, he literally um, was living next door to an active slave trade on Nevis. And so he saw up front uh, the slave trade. Um, you know, he made policy decisions himself in, in many cases to, um, you know, even though he may have had a personal disdain, disdain for slavery, the policy decisions that he supported, the compromises that he made with some of the Southern states, um, as we've talked about, uh, were not favorable, were really um, problematic um, for, for slaves and led to, you know, um, a really uh, delay, significant delay of opportunities for people of color in the United States. And that's truly unfortunate. And I think, you know, so I think one of the things that, that I think has been really important is to recognize that the founding fathers were flawed and that he didn't see some of those opportunities um, like we see and we've that have been exposed to us today 
and uh, really a core message of, of uh, in the concern. And I think Lynn Manuel Miranda has recognized that himself. I think, you know, he's tried to recognize that in his really phenomenal work, but he himself has said, you know, there's, there's um, serious concerns that, you know, thinking about the play today, um, he might've done some things differently. Well, and related to that, you had mentioned the work a little bit, the work that the Minneapolis Fed does to build an economy that works for all of us. There's a question in the chat about how the Fed's role has evolved over time and pointing out that that's one thing that the Minneapolis Fed is working on, that those equity gaps between blacks and whites in terms of achievement. Are there other concerns that have arisen from regional banks that have evolved over time? Yeah, and a good opportunity to provide a, a pitch for our races, racism and the economy series. It's a multi-part series, and I've had an opportunity to sort of, and the, the great thing, you know, we have to find, uh, you know, opportunities uh, and, and um, you know, positives out of this pandemic. The great thing about um, that has been, you know, those have been available more broadly to this audience across the country, so people can can have an opportunity to hear some of the great speakers, the economists, the policymakers, and others. And it's a collaboration across multi-federal reserve banks to support this discussion, these key discussions of racism in the economy. So I just want to highlight that for the group and go out on our website and sign up for one of those future sessions and go back and watch the videos of some of the previous ones that were really great. Yeah, and, and reserve banks um, have historically uh, you know, provided those um, early takes. I mean, we certainly represent our regions and we've noted our region, which is North and South Dakota and Montana, Minnesota, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Northwestern Wisconsin, um, and thinking about what's happening in our district and where there's opportunities. And, you know, we are the voice of our Ninth Federal Reserve District and we attempt to serve our public and see those things that you all see across our district and then provide sort of that opportunity um, and, and push uh, some of the thinking. Um, the great thing about the regional nature of the Fed, there's, there's, there's opportunity for really great intellectual thought to come from the reserve banks. We have a great set of economists here, policymakers, and Neil Kashkari has really brought some bold ideas, not only for our district, for, for the country more broadly, and that um, sort of distributed Federal Reserve System is really a true strength strength of the Fed. So I think you're going to you see that in multiple dimensions. Our too big to fail efforts, for example, over several years is another example where we've identified some opportunities uh, to support financial stability more broadly. So um, and you know that um, the the opportunity to hear from other districts, um, and we certainly have our examples, as do others that support uh, various policies that have um, hopefully served our economy and the people in our economy uh, more broadly over time. As you were talking, Neil, I typed in the Zoom chat box a link to our Racism in the Economy series if folks Perfect. would like to get more information about that. And in fact, if they'd like to read further, you had mentioned a book that had the history of the first central bank. Someone was wondering if you could name drop that again. Yes, um, it's by Scylla and Cohen, I believe, um, S-Y-L-L-A-C-O-W-E-N. And I, I, uh, I think it's a history of the Bank of the United States or something like that. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, and again, most of the work here that I drew from is really secondary resource, research. Folks uh, like those I've mentioned in the talk and many others are part of the, the bibliography for today's discussion. I drew very heavily from that did, you know, relatively little original research, except, you know, as I started to dig back into those newspapers, the early 1800s, as, you know, many of us do, I got so caught up in the research at times, I kept looking at some of the old history there, and it's really fascinating, and it's, it's really a gift to be able to go back to look at some of those, um, uh, some of that history, and remarkably, uh, the um, the duel was reported within seven days of the duel that took place in 1804. Uh, the last will and testament was published. The second, uh, the the views of the seconds were published in the newspapers of the day. So it's really helpful, in my view, to read those almost contemporaneous uh, views of what happened, especially during the duel. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today, Neil. We have reached the end of our time and we've gotten to, I believe, all of the questions in the chat box. If you are interested in joining us for a future event, we'd love to see you. I'll just put in the chat box right now. Our next event is a little different than this. Neil has been talking about the, the Fed's role historically in monetary policy, banking supervision. We have an upcoming conference in January on the COVID economy in the states of the Ninth District. It will feature a keynote address from North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, as well as economists from each of the six states in our region talking about COVID's impact on workers specifically in those regions. We'd love for you to join us. We have a link to that in the chat. We'd also love it if you would fill out our survey form as you exit the Zoom today to give us a little feedback. Thanks everyone for your time. We appreciate you being here.